Welcome to the talk on nudging. This is also known as four-dimensional data simulation. It's a method of nudging the model towards observations or analyses. Um, there are three applications I will show here. One is dynamical initialization, where you nudge for a pre-forecast period. One is creating a four-dimensional meteorological data set, for example, for air quality modeling. And one is for boundary conditions where you nudge an outer domain towards an analysis. When FTDA is activated, the model is run with extra nudging terms for horizontal winds, temperature, and water vapor. In analysis nudging, these terms nudge point by point to a 3D space and time interpolated analysis field. In OBS nudging, points near the observations are nudged uh, based on the model error at the observation site. Uh, the nudging is a relaxation term with a user-defined time scale around an hour or more, and the nudging also works with nesting and restarts. The first application I'll mention is dynamical initialization. The model domains are nudged towards an analysis in a pre-forecast period, for example, six hours ahead of the forecast. Uh, towards the analysis both at six hours and then zero hours uh, and the interpolation between these analyses. Um, so this has a benefit of a smooth startup at the forecast start time. The clouds will be initialized already. The uh, flow around topography will be balanced and then you can proceed with the regular forecast with nudging turned off. Another application is four-dimensional meteorological analysis. If you want a long-term high resolution data set that still obeys the large scale analyses over a long period, you can nudge the model towards those analyses, maybe every six hours, and then output the model every hour or whatever frequency you want, and it also may be on a higher resolution grid. So in this way you're using the model to interpolate between the analyses and also increase the resolution both in time and space. So the, the result is a high resolution um, balanced state with mass continuity obeying winds that can be used to drive an offline air quality model. This may be run for maybe a month, for example. The third application is boundary conditions where you nudge an outer domain towards analyses through the forecast. So this has a benefit of providing smoother boundary conditions to the domain of interest than if the, if for example here, the 15 kilometer domain is, is run as the outer domain. So here we've added a 45 kilometer domain outside, which could be thought of as a very wide boundary zone. But it also has high time resolution because the model is being run here with its own time step and then features coming into the 15 kilometer domain will also have better time resolution than if the 15 kilometer domain was the outer domain. There are two basic methods of uh, FDDA. Um, one is grid or analysis nudging, which is suitable for course resolution where the analysis uh, may be uh, trustworthy. And then the observation or station nudging, which is suitable for fine scale or asynoptic observations because you can use observations between analysis times in this method. So the nudging can be applied, as I mentioned, to winds, temperature, and water vapor. Nudging terms are note are fake sources, so avoid FDDA use in dynamics or budget studies. Analysis nudging is activated by grid FDDA equals one. Each grid point is nudged towards a value that is time interpolated from the analysis. Um, this shows the equation with the nudging terms on. Here, p star is like mu in WARF. It's just a weighting function for the mass in the column. And um, then these are the regular forcing terms, f. And then the nudging term looks like this with a relaxation term at the end here, where alpha 0 is the analysis you want to nudge towards, and alpha is the model variable. This shows the terms in the equation. Um, G is the inverse time scale. W is a weighting function, which could be a vertical uh, varying function between 1 and 0. And um, epsilon is a, a horizontal weight that we don't use. And then this is the relaxation term again.
3D analysis nudging uses the Wolf input fields at multiple times that are put into the Wolf FDDA file by program real when you run real with grid FDDA equals one. With low time resolution analysis, it is recommended not to use 3D grid nudging in the boundary layer, especially for temperature. So we have a switch that you can turn it off in the boundary layer. So when you're nudging uh, towards a 3D analysis, you're mainly nudging the upper air. And um, then we also have surface 2D analysis nudging, which does nudge based on surface analyses that you may have at a higher time frequency and only nudges in the boundary layer. So analysis nudging has several name list options. Um, you can choose the frequency of your nudging calculations, typically maybe five minutes. You don't have to compute the nudging weights every time step. The nudging time scale for each variable, that's the G, and uh, those would be uh, inverse seconds. Um, which variable is not to nudge in the boundary layer? So there's a log, uh, basically a logical test there. Um, the model level, alternatively, the model level um, below which you don't want to turn uh, nudging on. So instead of nudging only above the PBL, you nudge only above a certain model level. And also a ramping period over which nudging is turned off. So at the end of your nudging time, you might want to turn off nudging for the free forecast. So you can ramp it down over a period of one or two hours typically, and that will um, ramp down the nudging strength um, as the forecast begins. We also have surface analysis nudging. Um, here it's a, a 2D input file um, where you set both grid FDDA equals one and grid SFDDA equals one. And then you need a WARF SFDDA file. And that's created by a pre-processing program called OBSGRID, which takes some um, analyses at a higher frequency and can create surface analyses um, that are suitable for input to WARF in this WARF SDD, FDDA file. Uh, the weights are, can be chosen differently from the upper air analyses, so there's a GUV surface, etc. Um, you have to set grid FDDA equals one on to activate this surface uh, nudging as well. If you don't want upper air nudging, you just have to set those weights to zero. Since version 3.8, we also have a newer version called grid S FDDA equals two, which is called which is the flux adjusted surface data simulation system uh, provided by EPA. Um, this special option also nudges the uh, soil state, and it only works currently with the YSU PBL and uh, NOAA LSM. We also have spectral nudging, which is a form of grid nudging that selects uh, our larger scales alone to nudge. Um, so it allows the model small scales to evolve with no nudging, but keeps the large scale on track. So this may be useful for controlling longer wave phases for long analysis-driven simulations for months or years. Usually if your domain is very large, um, maybe the long waves uh, might go slightly out of phase in the interior of the domain, so this is a way to keep them in phase if, you're, if you want to keep your simulation on track with the analyses or reanalyses. So having this term on in nudges the interior and it compensates for the error due to low frequency narrow lateral boundary conditions. It can kind of correct the long waves uh, which may be distorted by just having this narrow lateral boundary zone. You choose it, the um, scales you want to nudge with the top wave number in each direction, the x and the y direction. So for example, if you choose wave number three, the wavelength is one third of the domain size in that direction. So for a 3000 kilometer domain and number three, your uh, top wave number you're nudging is uh, 1000 kilometers and you're not nudging anything shorter than that. Um, so typically you choose it, as I showed, as I mentioned, domain size divided by wave number is about a thousand, or some people may use 500, but those are the kinds of sizes you would like to nudge with spectral nudging. It nudges slightly different fields from the regular grid nudging. It's UV and theta again, but now geopotential instead of moisture, although moisture we do have as an option, but uh, that was added recently. 
more often you don't need to nudge the large scale moisture field um, you only want to nudge the large scale dynamics fields you can also nudge all levels or you can ramp um, above a specified model level so this is where you can use this ZFAC, KZFAC and DKZFAC um, switches to control what levels you want to nudge quite often spectral nudging is not applied in the lower level of the model it's just applied in the upper air and uh, above the boundary layer OBS nudging is if you want to control the model at perhaps high resolution but you have your own observations you want to add that are additional to any analysis that was used um, to initialize the model and so it allows you to add observations even while the model is running and so the model would be treated like a moving analysis in that sense uh, each grid point is nudged using a weighted average of the differences from the observations within a radius of influence and a time window it looks like this um, formula here uh, which is the, the regular forcing terms plus this uh, complex looking nudging term but again it has a relaxation but now it's a sum over errors at different observation sites. This is 1 to n number of observations influencing a particular grid point and uh, a weighted sum of those errors is what um, is, is causing the nudging term in the model. And the weighting function again is um, it's a function of xy which is a function of radius or distance from the observation and it's a function of the vertical level you don't want to be too far from the observation and also the time window. So this is an illustration. The grid point is this square here, and these may be three observations, two of which are within a radius of influence of the grid point. So these two will go into that sum that controls the, uh, uh, the magnitude of the nudging. The closer one will have a higher weight because of this weighting um, summation that was being done. So that, and this observation doesn't go into it at all. So this is. Um, weighted according to the number of observations that are within the radius. This shows the form of the weighting terms. The distance weight is given by this, where R is the radius of influence that you can specify, and D is the distance of the observation of the grid point. And so this is uh, like a bell function if you plot it, but it, it weights uh, closer points more strongly. Of course, beyond R, it goes to zero. There is a slight modification of distance, which is um, based on the elevation difference. So you don't nudge up and down slopes of nearby hills, for example. So it, it kind of effectively push, pushes that up to a further distance if it's not at the same elevation. There's also a time window, which is given here. It's a full weighting within a time window, but then it ramps up and down using this function outside the time window over a period of the time window divided by two. So it's a ramped, it ramps up and then flat and then down again. So you're only um, nudging the observation close to the observation time. Again, that's a something you can choose in your name list. The uh, vertical weighting W sigma is usually a very small number. We don't want to nudge other than at the same level. So especially when you have soundings as part of your observations, you, you keep this small to make sure only one uh, sounding level or the nearby sounding levels are influencing the correct point. The observation input file is a special um, text file um, called obsdomain1. With uh, observations sorted in chronological order, um, this is something you often have to create yourself. Although we do have programs, utility programs, to convert standard data from other common formats into this format. Each record in the observation is a UV temperature and moisture at a given model position and time. Um, the it doesn't matter if some are missing. It, for example, you might have a wind profiler. So you only have U and V values, and then you put missing values in for temperature and moisture. 
Um, since uh, version 3.1, OpsGrid can create this file from standard observations that are in a format we call little r. There are nameless options that go with observation nudging. Um, one is the frequency of the nudging calculations. Uh, you don't have to calculate all the nudging tendencies every time step. You can use this to control it in minutes. Also, the nudging time scale for each variable, how strongly you want to nudge each variable, you can control with the OPSCOF wind, etc. Also, the horizontal and vertical radius of influence. Um, the vertical one you would keep small, but the, the horizontal one you might want to change based on how dense your observations are and how much you want the uh, nudging to overlap between the observation sites. There's also the time window, which again you may choose based on the frequency of your observations so that you don't have too many observations at the same place in the same time window. So if you have hourly observations, you may want to set your time window smaller than an hour, for example. Um, and also the ramping period, we have that option as with the grid nudging, where you can turn the nudging off over a period of time after you've finished with the nudging and want to go into a free forecast. For advanced usage, and if you're nudging surface data, um, there are some switches you can use for flexibility on how you ramp the um, effect of the surface field into the atmosphere. Um, these uh, switches are named OBS nudge full and OBS nudge ramp for each variable and the number is a regime like one is stable and four is unstable and you can control these heights um, first the full height and then the ramp height and the full height can go to the, from the PBL top or it can go to some lower level that's below the PBL top. You can choose that as well. So the default values are fine if you don't want to um, change these nameless options. But they're there in case you're interested in changing the weighting of your surface observation with height. So this is a summary of the FDDA capability in WARF. Grid nudging is suitable for course to grid sizes, where the analysis can be better than the model produced fields over a longer period of time, so it keeps the model on track um, with those analyses. If you have a very high resolution model, you, you may um, harm it by nudging towards a course analysis, so you do have to make sure your analysis is reasonably well matched to your model resolution before you nudge towards it. Spectral nudging is a way of just exerting a large scale control and so it allows the model at fine scales to do its own thing and um, only controls the long waves. So for long periods and large domains, it's a way of keeping the model on track with the long waves. OBS nudging can be used to assimilate asynoptic or high frequency observations during your model run. That's often used at high resolution. If you have a, a lot of observations, you'd like to somehow improve your model simulation width. Grid and OBS nudging can be combined. You can run both together. Sometimes you might have grid nudging on an outer domain and OBS nudging in the nest. Note again that the nudging is a fake source and sync of the variables, so when you're doing budgets you would not want to have nudging turned on. Um, they're only there to control the model over long periods and in regions where you're not doing budgets.